surprise. My dear friends, I hear you thinking, here comes the old professor to lecture us again. But I promise to be brief and only by way of introduction. Uh, the reason I feel I should say a few words, <coughs> if you pardon my croaky voice, I too have the English disease, like so many of you. The royal flu. <coughs> uh, the reason I feel I ought to say something is that for more than 30 years, 35 years to be exact, uh, people have asked me why Candide, whither and whence Candide. And I thought I might answer a bit more clearly by speaking not only as the composer of this work, but as an everyday observer of history, like anyone here, but particularly of that period of history known as the Age of Enlightenment, roughly the 18th century. And that was the century in which Voltaire lived, wrote, and had extraordinary influence. His masterpiece was a tough, skinny little novella called Candide, which inspired the playwright Lillian Hellman and me to have a bash at it musically. Now, Voltaire's book was actually entitled Candide or Optimism, it being a viciously satirical attack on a prevalent philosophical system known as optimism, which was based on the rather indigestible writings of a certain Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz and popularized by our own beloved Alexander Pope. Uh, for example, in this great line from his essay on man, one truth is clear, whatever is, is right. Now, according to Leibniz, whose ideas Pope was lyricizing, if we believe in a creator, then he must be a good creator, and the greatest of all possible creators, and therefore could have created only the best of all possible worlds. In other words, everything that is, is right. Granted that in this world the innocent are mindlessly slaughtered and that crime mostly goes unpunished, but there is disease and death and poverty. But if we could only see the whole picture, the divine universal plan, then we would understand that whatever happens is for the best. Thus spake Leibniz. Naturally, Voltaire found this idea absurd every day of his life. But particularly on that day in 1755, when all of Lisbon, Portugal, exploded in an earthquake, and uncountable numbers of people were drowned, crushed, buried alive, exterminated. Now if Leibniz was right, said Voltaire, then God is just playfully spraying his flit gun and down go a million mosquitoes at random, haphazardly. Well, the Lisbon disaster was the last straw for Voltaire and provoked him to write Candide, in which he lashed out against all established authority, royal, military, or mercantile, but most of all at the power of the church, which actually was burning heretics at the time, burning them alive to prevent earthquakes. In other words, says Voltaire, sectarian religion is always an incitement to conflict. And optimism, as a strict belief, therefore breeds complacency, induces lethargy, inhibits the human power to change, to progress, to rise against injustice, or to create anything that might contribute to a genuinely better world. Uh, during my incredibly extensive researches for this lecture, which you are now suffering, <laughs> I. Uh, I came across the following quite succinct summing up of the whole Voltaire-isme. Quote, Voltaire was acting as an eclectic who had synthesized the ideas of the Stoics, the Epicureans, the skeptics. Oh, the hell with it. Let's play the overture. <laughs> Thank you.
Westphalia that our story opens at Schloss Thundertentronk. Westphalia, for Voltaire and his readers, was a remote and backward land, full of people who spoke an incomprehensible language and ate pork all year round. In short, a, a source of terrible ethnic jokes. <laughs> In this pretentious pigsty of a castle, we meet Candide, the personification of innocence, but the, alas, illegitimate nephew of the snobbish little baron, Thunder Ten Trunk. Candide is equally patronized by the immensely fat baroness and their amazingly vain son, Maximilian. <laughs> but Candide is befriended by their beautiful daughter, Cunegonde. All of which makes Candide very happy. Life is happiness indeed. Mares to ride and books to read. Though of noble birth I'm not, I'm delighted with my lot. Though I've no distinctive features and I've no official mother, I love all my fellow creatures and the creatures love each other. All the young people were happy. Even Paquette, the pretty young serving maid who enjoyed the honor of undressing the baroness and sometimes the baron himself. <laughs> if there was any cloud over the happiness of the baron's son, Maximilian, and the baron's daughter, Cunegonde, it was, it was the difficulty of deciding which of them was the lovelier. <laughs> Life is absolute perfection, as is true of my complexion. Every time I look and see me, I'm reminded life is dreamy. Although I do get tired being endlessly admired, people will go on about me. How could they go on without me? If the talk at times is vicious, that's the price you pay when you're delicious. Life is pleasant, life is simple. Oh my God, is that a pimple? No, it's just the odd reflection. Life and I are still perfection. I am everything I need. Life is happiness indeed. Life is happiness indeed. I have everything I need. I am rich and unattached. To be happy. The greatest philosopher on earth, Dr. Dr. Pangloss. Let 
Let us review lesson 11. Paragraph 2, axiom 7. Once one dismisses the rest of all possible worlds, one finds that this is the best of all possible worlds. Once one dismisses the rest of all possible worlds, one finds that this is the best of all possible worlds. Brain classify. Pigeons and camels. Pigeons can fly. Camels are mammals. Well, there is a reason for everything under the sun. There is a season for everything under the sun. Objection! What about snakes? Snakes. Was snake the tempted Mother Eve? Because of snake, we now believe that though depraved, we can be saved from hellfire and damnation. Because of snake's temptation, if snake had not seduced our lot and primed us for salvation, Jehovah could not pardon all the sins that we call cardinal, involving bed and battle. Now on to Aristotle. A mankind is one. All men are brothers. As have done to unto others. It's understood in this best of all possible worlds. Also the good in this best of all possible worlds. Objection! What about war? Oh, the war may seem a bloody curse. It is a blessing in reverse when cannon roar, both rich and poor, by danger are united. Till every wrong is righted. Philosophers make evident the point that I have cited. Tis war makes equal as it were the noble and the commoner. Thus war improves relations. Now to conjugations. Amo, amas, amat, amamus. Amo, amas, amat, amamus. Proving that this is the best of all possible worlds. With love and kisses, the best of all possible worlds. What are the demons Dismissed. At this point in the play, Candide observes Dr. Pangloss giving Paquette a private lesson in very basic physics. Inspired by their example, Candide and Cunagonda eagerly look forward to the marital joys that await them. When we feel we can afford it, we'll build us humble little farm. We'll buy a yacht and live aboard it, rolling in luxury and stylish charm. Cows and chickens, social girls, peas and cabbage, ropes of pearls. Soon we'll have little ones beside us. We'll have a sweet Westphalian home. Some who will grow as rich as Midas. We'll live in Paris when we're not in Rome. Smiling babies. Marble halls. Sunday picnics. Costume balls. Champagne. 
my life, feeding the pigs and sweetly growing old. Breast of peacock, apple pie, I love marriage. So do I. Oh, happy pair, oh, happy pair, it's very rare, I feel free. Oh, happy pair, happy pair, happy pair, it's very rare, I feel free. Oh, happy pair, happy pair, it's very rare, I feel free. Oh, happy pair, happy pair, it's very rare, I feel free. Indeed, underestimates our family's outrage at his daring to embrace my sister. The little bastard is therefore expelled from Schloss Thunder Ten Tonk with many a hefty boot up the fundament. Exiled from paradise, my poor Candide wanders alone with only optimism to cling to. My world is thus now, and all I love is dead. So let me trust now in what my master said. There is a Every wall, it must be so, it must be so. Discovered at dawn, asleep in a field, Candide is press-ganged into a foreign army. He tries to desert, but is arrested, whereupon his loyal comrades in arms lay bare every single nerve from the back of his neck to his buttocks. At which moment, war breaks out, and the enemy army invades Westphalia. The Baron and his family are at prayer.
everyone is massacred. Maximilian, the Baron, Paquette, and Pangloss himself. The Baroness is cut in pieces. Cunegonde raped repeatedly before she is bayoneted to death. Among the ruins, Candide searches for her corpse.
entirely alone in the world and starving, Candide is befriended by a kindly Anabaptist. What's an Anabaptist? A devout Christian who didn't believe in infant baptism or any other sectarian idea over which you could start a war. Thank you. The few coins the Anabaptist has given him, however, are squandered on an old beggar with a tin nose and many fingers missing, ravaged by syphilis. In this first of many credulity-stretching reappearances traditional to the picaresque novel, what is a picaresque novel? A type of novel in which every page takes us to a different country and every paragraph contains some new adventure. Thank you. As I said, in the first of many credulity-stretching reappearances, Candide discovers that the old beggar with the tin nose is, are you ready, his old master Pangloss. I must now explain my lamentable condition. Me speak with sorrow or the rancor of what has shriveled up my cheek and blasted it with canker. Twas love, great love, that did the deed through nature's gentle laws. And how should ill effects proceed from so divine a cause? from bees that sting as you are well aware to one adept in reasoning whatever pains disease may bring are but the tangy seasoning to love's delay They say, conveyed the virus hither, whereby my features rot away and vital powers wither. Yet had they not traversed the seas and come infected back, why think of all the luxuries that modern life would lack? Things conduce to sweet as this example shows. Without the little spider we'd have no chocolate to eat, nor wood tobacco's fragrance greet the Europeans. Guards his native land with cannon and the sentry. Inspectors look for contraband at every point of entry. Yet nothing can prevent the spread of love's divine disease. It rounds the world from bed to bed as pretty as you please. Worship Venus everywhere, as may be clearly seen. For decorations which I bear are nobler than the Croix de Guerre, and gained in service to our fair and universal queen.
kindly Anabaptist, remember him, takes them both aboard a ship bound for Lisbon. Pangloss argues with the Anabaptist. Ergo, this must be the best of all possible worlds. Why? Men were not born wolves, and yet everywhere they've turned into wolves. Know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Well, our debate was interrupted by a storm. The kindly Anabaptist, while trying to rescue a sailor, is kicked into the sea and drowned. And the ship splits in half. Candide and Dr. Pangloss float ashore on a plank. At that moment, as Voltaire puts it, quote, a volcano near Lisbon fulfills its natural function and erupts, unquote. 30,000 men, women, and children are killed. Candide and Pangloss are arrested as heretics by spies of the Spanish Inquisition and are taken to the auto da fe, public torture and execution surrounded by all the fun of the fair. Here they face the Grand Inquisitor and his henchmen. <laughs> and pills for your fevers and chills. But we haven't any money, so there's nothing we can do. Any kind of metal, any kind of metal, any kind of metal, gold and sold. Any kind of metal, any kind of metal, any kind of metal, turn to gold. Pots and pans, metal cans, bought or traded or sold. I can turn them into gold. Pans and pots and whatnot, trading you ones for old. For a tiny fee, my alchemy can turn them into gold. Execute me. I'm too sick to die. What do you mean, sick? Oh, my darling Paquette, she is haunting me yet with a dear souvenir I shall never forget. Twas a gift that she got from a seafaring Scot. He deceived, he believed in Shalot. In Shalot from his dame, who was certain it came with a kiss from a Swiss. She'd forgotten his name, but he told her that he had been given it free by a sweet little cheat in Paris. Who had a man from Japan, then a moor from Iran, but the moor isn't sure how the whole thing began, but the gift you can see had a long pedigree when at last it was passed on to me. The love is sweet, love is sweet, and the custom is sound, for it makes the world go round. I repeat, love is sweet, and the custom is sound, for as we have shown, it's love alone that makes the world go round. Oh, well, the moor in the end spent a night with a friend, and the dear souvenir just continued its trend to a young English lord who was stunned, they record, by a wasp in a hospital ward. Oh, well, the wasp on the wing had occasion to sting a Milano soprano who brought home the thing to a young paramour who was rendered impure and forsook her to look for the cure. Thus he happened to pass through Westphalia, alas where he met with Paquette, and she drank from his glass. I was pleased as can be when it came back to me. Makes us all just a small family. <laughs>
is hanged, Candide flogged. The latter reflects on the grand theory of optimism. It must be me, 
it must be me. My master told me the world is warm and good. It deals more coldly than I had dreamt it would. There must be sunlight I cannot see. It must be me. It must be But meanwhile, in Paris! mysterious masked beauty has captivated the hearts of two men, a rich Jew named Don Issachar and the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris. The Jew has her on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and his Sabbath. The Archbishop Wednesdays, Fridays, and his Sabbath. On Saturday nights, there is occasionally some dispute. The masked beauty sees herself as compelled to glitter, forced to be gay.
Candide, having arrived in Paris by one of those credulity-stretching coincidences we are familiar with in the, uh... The oh, thanks, fellas. <laughs> Candide in Paris recognizes his pure, lost love. Oh, oh. oh. Is it true? Is it true? Gunde, 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 gunde. reunion is interrupted by an old lady here and after known as the old lady <laughs> who has come to warn Kunaganda of the approach first of the Jew and then of the Cardinal in a flurry of dramatic activity Candide inadvertently stabs them both <laughs> to death the cardinal is entombed in a great cathedral. The Jew's body is dropped in the nearest sewer. I always hated the Jew in this show anyway. <laughs> that will do. Candide, Cunegonde, and the old lady make a hairbreadth escape to Cadiz, taking with them all Cunegonde's jewels. On the journey, the old lady tells them her entire life story. She is, she claims, the daughter of a pope. Oddly enough, a Polish pope. <laughs> it could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> she has been raped by a pirate captain, is the survivor of a racial pogrom in North Africa, of years as a slave under various Turks. And a siege in which one of her buttocks has been cut off and cooked as emergency rations. <laughs> now, during the telling of this spellbinding saga, 
They have been robbed of everything. The old lady, ever resourceful, offers to sing for their Spanish supper, especially about her birth in Ravna Gubernia. Critics have found no reference to Ravna Gubernia in Voltaire's entire text. Uh, I, okay, I confess, uh, I made it up. It's, it's my lyric, and my father was born in Ravna Gubernia somewhere in the southern region of Russia, Ukraine. To be totally honest, I couldn't find a rhyme in English or Spanish for Rovna Guberga, <laughs> try though I did, uh, until late one night, I mentioned the problem to my wife, Felicia, who had been asleep for hours, I woke her up. And she was Chilean by nationality, and therefore a Spanish speaker, and she suggested she said, well, me muero, me salio una hernia, which means I'm dying and growing a hernia. <laughs> it turns out that this is a local Chilean idiom, uh, which is prevalent also in Colombia, Mexico, and other places, Cadiz. Anyway, it was a brilliant rhyme. And in fact, all the Spanish lines in this song are Felicia's, God bless her.
what, you might ask, can follow that? <laughs> Only this. They have to flee again. The police in Paris have found out about the murder of the Archbishop and the Jew. Remember them? <laughs> this being a picaresque novel, Candide is suddenly and conveniently offered a commission fighting for the Jesuits in Montevideo, South America, including a free passage for Cunegonde and the old lady if he will immediately take ship for the New World. Oh, to hell with it. Let's sing the finale of Act One. <laughs> Once again, we must be gone, moving onward to the New World. Shall I there is that land so good and fair. Yeah. 